thank you all for coming to our, um, this is our third Tea Talk in the series, and um, we're really very excited about this program and our panel panelists today. Um, before we get started, I just want to thank my audience again and thank our sponsors and our co-sponsors, uh, SAC, um, Kel, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, they had a wonderful event last night, too, so thank you so much. Um, TD Bank for supporting us. We thank them. And um, on the back of your programs are the rest of our sponsors. Um, I want to thank my panelists uh, for coming. And we, if you have been watching us, we have two new panelists, and they're going to add a, a nice, fresh perspective to our talk today. And I've been remiss in thanking our volunteers um, who help, who without them we really couldn't do the work that we do. So I just want to just take a moment to thank and have our volunteer stand. Um, Linda, Sarah, Freddie, Angela, Brad, Ryan, see it takes all of us, it takes a village. <laughs> and of course, we wouldn't be here without our indomitable leader, um, starter, uh, Miss Valerie Cunningham. <laughs> so today's program is about the film, Birth of a Nation. And I'm going to let the experts talk on this today, because um, I love this film. And I hope that we'll have some great dialogues around it, not only about the historical perspective, um, the story that the film tells, um, but also its current implications and the way Hollywood um, treats black films and, of course, the controversy around the producer. So we'll take a look at all the issues today and hopefully You'll all join in this dialogue. It's really important to us that we have a dialogue between the audience and our presenters, because that's how we really move the needle one step further along of understanding and um, hopefully changing the environment in which we live, especially now. So I'm going to pass it all over to our panelists for them to say, say, uh, talk a little bit about the film. We're waiting on a new computer so we can actually show bits and pieces of the film, but we'll start our program and keep the dialogue going until it's all set up. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm Delia Consett, and I teach um, English and Cinema Studies at the University of New Hampshire. And I just kind of wanted to introduce, um, uh, introduce the uh, film. Uh, it's too hard to hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, should I repeat everything? Oh, okay. Okay. So, <laughs> so the birth of a nation. Um, it premiered in um, uh, January of 2016 at the Sundance Film Festival. Um, the Sundance Film Festival is a festival for indie filmmakers, uh, usually films that are made on low budgets or indie films, which um, Birth of a Nation fell under because I think it only had an $8.5 million um, production budget, which is very low. So um, it premiered at Sundance. It, the crowd went wild. And Fox Searchlight offered the unheard of salary of $17 million to its director, um, producer, um, and star and writer, um, uh, Nate Parker, um, offered him the $17.5 million, and a huge thing was made about this, and people were very excited about, um, about the film. Well, um, they started, you know, the, the, the um, rollout for a film is, is, um, takes time, the publicity. Uh, they started on um, July 4th weekend already because it has that patriotic element in it. Um, they started, um, uh, they released the trailer right after that, and they set it for release in October 2016. 
Um, however, already in the summer, um, because of all the Oscar buzz that was surrounding it, um, uh, allegations of rape, and actually um, one of them had been charged with rape, but then it was overturned. Um, Jean Celestin, am I saying his name or yeah, does it say John? Writers, yeah, he's the co-writer. Um, and both um, he and Nate Parker were students at Penn State, and there was accusations of rape. And these accusations, because of all the publicity, came to the fore, and there was a movement to um, uh, throw that up, and a lot of feminists, especially black feminists, got into it um, and started advertising it. Uh, and of course, in with the wake of Bill Cosby and all the attention that that has drawn, as well as other rape allegations that have been going on, um, it drew it drew quite a bit of attention. Um, and then when the film premiered in October of 2016, um, it was a box office flop. It didn't do well at all. And according to um, uh, um, certain people, it was due to the <coughs> black feminists. Uh, other um, the um, other people have written in that it wasn't that good of a film. And so this is what we want to discuss about the film and what was going on if indeed feminists had that much power where they could ruin a film. You know, I, some, I, I sincerely doubt it. I think there were other, I think it played a part, but there were um, other um, elements at play that I think uh, foregrounded it. So. Um, Perhaps we could just discuss, um, you know, that that's the context of the film and all that surrounds it. Oh, we can yeah, now just watch the DVD. It. Oh, I'm just um, waiting for the DVD. Okay. My name is Nancy Botter. I think I know a lot of you. Um, my husband and I produced Shadows Fall North, which stars Valerie Cunningham and Jerry Ann Bogus, on Black History in New Hampshire. And um, my relationship with this film quickly. Uh, my husband and I saw that it was coming out when it started being promoted over the summer. Uh, got really excited about it because we thought it was a great play on the uh, the original birth of a nation, which, if some of you don't know, was uh, you know I learned I, I mean I studied that film in film school because it was one of the first movies made and made with lightning, made with lightning <laughs> of the worst kind. Of the worst kind. And I went to the University of Georgia and I saw that film there and I was uh, a, a little disturbed by the original film, which has a clip, uh, you know, the birth of a nation, and then it has a clip of the KKK coming to the rescue of this country because there are lazy blacks all over the Congress with their feet up on, you know. Eating fried chicken. Eating fried chicken, yeah. It was, uh, <laughs> it was pretty horrific. Yeah, um, yeah. the KKK. See it. The and the KKK, were, yes, the heroes. So when my husband and I found out this was coming out, we were very excited to go see it. It came out in October, uh, the same time Jerry Ann and I were representing our film at one of the largest black history conferences in the country. And we decided one night to go see this film. And we went, and uh, I was definitely part of the minority in this packed movie house. And I have to tell you, it was a visceral, visceral, to the core of my soul experience to see that movie. And as a filmmaker, I don't know why people are saying it's a bad, well, I have an idea. We can talk about that later. I thought it was. I, 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 thought it, I thought it was a good film, and, and perhaps when I first saw it um, in that particular audience, it took my understanding of white privilege to a whole new level. And uh, so that's what, that's what I bring to this panel, is the film. And, and also the, the rape accusations of Nate Parker, which happened in 1999, so it's interesting, they've, they've always been a public record, and it's interesting to me that they surfaced in 2016. He was acquitted. I read a lot of stuff about it, and we can, we can get into that. Um, and, and rape is not something that we want to look over, but we still go to Woody Allen movies. And we so. Some Roman and Roman Polanski and Casey oh. Affleck is up for an and Academy Casey Award. A yeah, 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 yeah. So anyway, uh, something to think about as we talk about the film as we go through it. Can I just before we get on to the next speaker, 
Um, did Jerry you want to show? Did you want to show part of this? Do you want to? Have, it's ready to play, and um, you just have I to. Think we were going to talk. Oh, yeah, we'll okay. okay. Great. Okay. 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 Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Rayvon Millings. Uh, I'm a senior at UNH. Um, so my connection to the film is uh, on campus. Uh, I'm uh, the president of a group on campus for men of color. So um, there's about 30 of us uh, current active members, and uh, we took the guys to go see the film uh, when it first came out because we thought it would be important uh, to to go watch and go experience together um, and talk about it and debrief after, and that's what we usually do. Uh, so I'm not really going to say my opinions in the film right now. I feel like I'll come later. Um, but what I will say is, um, at first, uh, I didn't know what to expect. You know, usually in your history books, um, you know, growing up, it, there's, 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 not, there's not really a lot about uh, Nat Turner in the actual history books of itself. So in reality, you have to either go seek that information somewhere else or just not know it at all. So when I realized the movie was coming out about it, I was like, okay, well, this would be a great time to actually, um, you know, get a, a visual image of what, as to what you see in the textbooks or what you don't really see in textbooks or what you learn. So um, I thought the movie was a good opportunity for me to learn more about the film or learn more about the topic about Nat Turner. But, um, you know, there's a lot of controversy in it, and we'll get into that later. So. I'm uh, Joe Anosco. Uh, I'm out at UNH as well in the education department, and uh, we've done this about five or six years in a row now. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm also uh, the one of the three Portsmouth Police Commissioners, so I wear a couple of hats. But today I'm exclusively a citizen because right-wingers are requesting right-to-know uh, statements out of intimidation if you engage an audience that uh, has left-leaning tendencies, which I assume is this group. So, uh, I'm speaking exclusively as a citizen, and I have not used and I have not, uh, I have not used any UNH equipment in preparation for this uh, discussion. Uh, uh, I put together the handout, and what I tried to do is uh, represent a variety of uh, perspectives on the film. The first one is quite positive, and then the other ones present uh, what the critics see as uh, various problems with the film, including the rape accusation charge, and a couple of uh, female black uh, feminist film critics and scholars have come out pretty hard on uh, Nate Parker uh, for that event back in 1999. But for now, I think I'll just I'll hold off on uh, some of my thoughts and comments on the film. I think it's a terrific selection. I'm curious, how many of you have seen the film? <coughs> okay, so uh, only about a third. So I think these video clips uh, may help give give uh, the others a, a little feel for the film. Yeah. Oh. Uh, so these were some of the scenes that. Um, uh, some uh, a lot of critics complained about, um, namely that the two rape scenes, which um, weren't part of the historical um, uh, fact about Nat Turner and his rebellion, um, but are put into the film, and the way it's depicted, um, as you can see, the rape occurs off screen, which you know I can understand that it would. It would be um, rather brutal. Um, but yet at the same time, we never, the women are never, ever given close-ups or allowed to speak about their pain. It's always channeled via the men. Um, when uh, Cherry gets raped and beat, she's in there, and if you notice, they use shallow focus. You can hardly see her face. She's out of focus when she's lying on the bed, and he is always center screen. Now, he directed he wrote and he produced this film. And constantly throughout, and this is where um, the New Yorker, I believe, was it Scott Brody, who said absolute vanity, um, because he's always in the center and everything goes via him. His wife, um, it, uh, she suffers, but it's because he suffers. And even with his hand or whatever, when he holds her hand, his hand is always um, precedent. Um, when the, the bleeding occurs, it's his vision, um, his corn, his hand is there. 
um, and we hardly see her face, and, and she just disappears after the rape scene. We see her one more time, and a couple more times, but she has very few scenes. The women do not come up to the fore, um, and everyone else, um, even the men, play a, um, a very small role. Nat Turner is center, and if you notice, he's always there in the middle, um, staged right in the middle, which makes it very traditional. The cinematography can't really take off because um, occasionally they use it here or there, especially <coughs> towards the end with the apocalypse and the eclipse, and they use various sorts of things. However, um, the cinematography does not come to the fore as in, let's just, uh, it's been compared to 12 Years a Slave. Um, 12 Years a Slave had an, an amazing cinematography, and they showed the background a lot more, and so you got all of that. And in addition, you had a real ensemble cast. You had Chiwetel Ejiofor, you had Alfie Woodard, you had Lupita Nyong'o, you had, um, uh, who else was in it? Um, a bunch of, st um, Michael Fassbender as the crazy uh, slaveholder. You had Benedict Cumberbatch. You had all of these sorts of people acting. Here, everything is channeled through him. Mm -hmm. And that leads to a very traditional way. You often see this in um, Lifetime movies where it comes through one person and you own, and it makes it, this is where the narrative and where a lot of people had difficulty with the aesthetics and the style of the film. It cuts all the cinematography, it cuts out the acting ensemble, it cuts out everything and just places him in the center. Um, take for instance, Hidden Figures, which is very melodramatic, uses similar things, uh, and takes a national history and uses it, but it's told by a three women. And you get all their perspectives, and it makes it a rich tapestry. This is called The Birth of a Nation. It's not the confessions of Nat Turner. Mm -hmm. And you do not get the nation. Even the religion falls to the side um, by him. The other slaves fall to the side. It's only Nat Turner um, who's at the center. And Nate Parker is a decent actor, but he's not enough to hold your interest. Mm -hmm. And I think this is where, um, in addition, uh, one, um, I think that uh, other people have brought this out. But in October, when this was released, it went wide release precisely because it got 17 million from Fox Searchlight. Hidden figures. Um, which has far outsold it and has been nominated, went limited release and just did small test at the market and then went right release. Instead, this was done in such an arrogant way, it immediately went right release during a time when um, October was the um, most lack, um, lackluster month in, um, in uh, 2016. So you have that on top of that. Think of what movies are. They're entertainment. So this would anyway, even 12 Years a Slave um, hasn't done that well at the box office. It has more critical response. These are not the kind of films that people flock. They're not blockbusters. <clears throat> and think of how one month later, Antoine Fuqua's um, The Magnificent Seven would go on to create a huge blockbuster. Mm. But this is a very different film. Uh, and this is, um, uh, with a film like this that starts off small, is about a subject, especially in this day and age, and we were just gearing up for the elections, <laughs> I, I, and with the resurgence of white nationalism, this is not going to do well. And uh, I don't think it was the black feminists. They don't have that much power. I don't think it helped, and they used that as an excuse um, not to... Uh, um, give the film uh, this kind of thing, but I do think that was the way in which it was handled. Um, Sundance is also an indie film um, outlet. This are not where, you know, these are not blockbusters that people are going to go run and see. Why they thought people at Sundance who are basically, a, it's attended by white liberals, of course they would stand up and clap and, and love it, but this is not your average, everyday going cinema audience. When you want to see cinema, especially during hard times, you want to see entertainment. This is not entertainment. Um, I do think the film does some good things. Um, 
it shows, um, it, it, I think it shows the brutality of slavery. It very, and it, its use of realism allows for that. Um, Django Unchained showed that, but it was done in this revenge plot deliberately, um, B film, and so it sensationalized. This doing it very realistically, and I remember being haunted, and it's, that, still, that scene still bothers me when they force feed. Um, force feed the guy and they knock out his teeth. I'm, I'm, oh, I mean, it's. With a chisel. Yeah, with a chisel. It's not even that violent. It is violent, but not that overtly violent, but it just, that, those sorts of things, the use of threats, the use of dogs, the way um, everything, the, the way his, um, his owner can, you know, buy or sell him and how much he's caught in the system of the economy. Um, um, Nat is making a lot of money for him and this is why his plantation is starting to do well again. And, uh, and you know, Nat is not, instead he's expected to give more um, service or whatever mm -hmm. and to do more just simply for his, um, uh, for his master. And I think he shows that, that, that's shown very nicely. But this would have never done well. I think at the box office. This is not like something like Hidden Figures. Um, even 12 Years a Slave, with all that wonderful cinematography, that that was very art house. You know, that was done in a very art house manner. They did limited release. They pushed it slow. I think, I, th I think overall, uh, domestically, um, it has only done 56 million, which is not. But it had, was a critical success. Um, this did only, I think, 17, 18 million, and it didn't, with the production was 8 million, 8.5 million, the production budget, and then 17.5 million was given to um, Nate Parker and, um, uh, to Nate Parker, and so he didn't earn back that amount of money. That's the death flow. Um, this is what happened with, um, um, uh, with uh, um, Empire, what um, uh, the guy who directs Empire and who did um, paper, Lee Daniels. Lee Daniels did some amazing films. Um, he did Precious. He did the Paperboy. Um, people at Cannes stood up and either screamed for it or booed it. Um, however, um, it was so controversial and it lost money, even though it's a magnificent film. The Paperboy is really, really wonderful. Um, very intersectional uh, with race, um, gender, sexuality, all of that coming to the fore, class issues and all of that. Um, really great and a, a wonderful um, acting team as well. Um, but um, it lost money and he knew he would have to change and Lee Daniels was known for taking chances. He produced um, Monster's Ball. He produced The Woodsman, with, which is about a pedophile, played by Kevin Bacon. Very difficult film that took a lot of chances. But he knew Harvey Weinstein, um, who's at Steven Spielberg, dropped out of the butler. And it's pure melodrama. And Harvey Weinstein said, gotta make money, come on, you're our thing, this is it. You are gonna be um, blacklisted if you don't do this. And so he did, and he, now you can see him making money with Empire, which is interesting, but it definitely caters, it's a soap opera. I'd love to hear what Ray has to do, because I, I had a totally different reaction than you did to the movie, but I'd love to hear mm -hmm. what you and your friends thought about. Uh, when it came to the movie, uh, I thought the most interesting part that kind of stuck out to me was the, um, so you talk about cinematography, I thought about the subtle ways in which they kept showing um, Sam Turner's, which, so that's his uh, slave master, and the one that he, in the movie, uh, played with as a kid. So I thought they kept showing the confliction on his face throughout the, throughout the movie as they progressed through different scenes. So, um, you know, for instance, uh, in the last scene that they showed, when the uh, the the was uh, the lady that uh, Gabrielle Union plays Gabrielle Union, she plays Dwayne Esther. Wade's Esther. wife in real yeah. life. Yeah. So yeah, Esther. So who's, who's wife is she? Dwayne Wade's wife. Oh, oh really? Yeah. 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 So yeah. when uh, Esther was pouring uh, the drink and the guy was talking about uh, flesh, you, when he was talking about you know wanting to get with her, you could see um, 
you know, Sam's face, he, he, was, he was smoking a cigar, and he gave him a look, he's like, okay, like, he could see what's going, because when they were there earlier, a couple scenes prior, you know, he offered him, do you want to stay? And, you know, when, when they, as you can see, the conditions, when he goes to different plantations, he can see how other slave masters treat their slaves. And you can see every time he goes, you know, like, like a piece of him dies. He's always seen something, he, he, you know, he's always, he can't stand the sight of these different conditions, how people are treated, and things like that. And it, it, and it's interesting because, you know, I think he wants, uh, he ends up, I think he kind of wants Nat to know, because once he lets Nat go to, uh, to you know, tend to his wife, he, he made sure let him know, he's like, look, you know, not other slave owners will let you go like I did. Um, just to let him know, like, hey, you know, I'm treating you well, you know, I, I think I'm treating you well compared to what you see, but he's still conflicted because he's also taking money for, you know, for these deeds that he's making him do. So, and then of course, you know, what that allows is, you know, that, that kind of, you can see how that kind of gives Nate the, 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 the power to do certain things as if uh, when he went to go baptize the, uh, the white man on his property, because you feel like, you know, when you thought you're the breadwinner, you're like, well, even though it's, it's weird, because, you know, in the time, you're like, you know, he would have no power, technically speaking, but he has power in that breadwinning sense, because without him being that, the person going out and preaching, the, the plantation has little to no money. And you know, and, and you would think how desperate of times it would have to be for you to take your, you know, one in the in the period of, you know, having your slave to be able to read, preaching the word, and then also, you know, how desperate time you have to be to, to start, you know, kind of solicit him out, you know, bring him out to all the places, actually bring him to, you know, physically bring him and collect the money. You're like, okay, time have to really be dire for you to actually do those things. And um, doing it with their labor. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. and it's like it's like making money on free labor on labor because because yeah. you're, st you're still gonna have him go out in the field. You're still gonna have him do that, and you're still gonna have him come to your house. So you're like kind of making this tenfold all over. Overtime. Yeah, yeah, all you know, just all over the place. Um, and also, what I thought was um, interesting, as I uh, I kind of lost my place here, but as I was uh, watching it, you know, some of, we had a conversation um, with. Uh, my group and um, the Black Student Union on campus, and um, you know, a, a lot of the, the women in the group echo the same sentiment of they felt as if um, you know the, the voices of the women um, in the movie was non-existent. Uh, I think I think the women in the movie have about 50 lines uh, <laughs> in two hours of footage. Um, majority of those lines come from his grandmother when she gave that speech after I think after he got whipped. Um, and even then, it was kind of, you know, it, it, it could have been told by a guy based on the topic of what she said. It could have, anybody could have said that speech. Um, and, and, and I did agree because, to be quite frank, the scene when, uh, I don't know, his name, Hal, I think, uh, Esther's husband, mm -hmm. when he was standing outside the door and he was like, you know, I wouldn't, I won't do it, right? To, you could have easily had her outside the door saying that exact same thing, or both of them together saying the same thing. I know, right? he says, I won't do it. Yeah, yeah. Like, so so I was, no yeah. so then I was like you know yeah. that that when you watch you like okay is that a deliberate kind of thing where in reality you know uh, I do understand the times in which it's the period piece so I understand mm -hmm. that you know okay in you know in the 1800s and back then right, I understand the voice is not as big as it is now right but then considering the fact that you know these scenes um, to our knowledge aren't you know 100% factual based then in reality you could have played that however you wanted to as a director, as the writer, screenwriter. Mm -hmm. You could have done how, whatever you decided, whatever you wanted yeah. in that space. So he chose to go in a certain direction. And um, with that being said, if, if, if I was a woman, um, especially a woman of color, I could understand as to why you would feel like, I don't know how you want to support this because you know, I understand the topic um, is important. And, but as well, you know, you wanna, when you go to movies, you go for a couple of reasons, entertainment, you go to see representation of yourself, right? Because it, that, that allows you to escape being actually getting into the movie. You're like, well, I can actually do something like that. Oh, I, that's plausible. So you kind of go for these kind of um, things. And uh, I could see as to why some people be apprehensive to support it because by the end of the day, it's your money, it's your hard on dollar, and you're gonna spend it on things that you wanna spend it on. And when you spend it, you wanna be able to say, yeah, that was a good spend, that was a good buy, I support this. And I understand that, you know, uh, based on his past, uh, you know, you feel like, you know, some people, you know, couldn't, you know, separate the artist and the art. So, and I'm like, that's a personal choice. And if you can't separate the artist from the art, then you don't support the art. That, that's a good point that you bring out, that um, relationship between him and the white master. And that's what I felt like it was, a, a battle of white father, white figure, 
versus the black figure. And when he kills him with the axe at the end, that, that you know, that's what it was all leading up to. It, it was a battle of men. Yeah. <laughs> battle yeah. of men. You know, if we, if we could, uh, if we could run, run time two different ways, it'll never, it would have never been a blockbuster. No. But it yeah. came out of Sundance, you know, as Delia said, 17 million, a record. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, no film had it has had ever been gotten 17 million before. Uh, you know, uh, Spike Lee says it's a landmark film that has changed the game. Oprah Winfrey came out. Everybody, male, female, white, and black, loved the film. And then uh, this issue of uh, Parker's um, uh, experience in Penn, at Penn State in 99 uh, got people looking into the testimony. It is not good. Uh, it was clearly a uh, problematic situation. He ended up transferring to Oklahoma State. He was just a college kid. All three of these individuals, the young woman and the two men, all came from very difficult uh, personal situations. The girl ended up committing suicide uh, in 2012. However, there are lots of other variables that uh, factored into what she did uh, 13 years later. Um, and as a result, I think a whole different set of eyes looked at that film again. And so there are really two different critiques. Mm -hmm. I think there would have always been the critique that it was basically uh, a film about white and black men competing for ownership of women. Uh, there's certainly that in the film and absolutely justified. And if you look at, don't look now, but on the back page that I gave you a number of critiques um, that talk about the uh, lack of voice among women and, uh, and, and other slaves, uh, frankly, the men as well, mm -hmm. and including the male rebels, and it, uh, they amounted to 80 mm -hmm. by the end of the film. They started with a band of seven or eight, and they never did get to Jerusalem. It's now called Portland, Virginia. It's a little bit uh, southwest uh, of uh, Richmond. And, uh, but they ended up getting 80 folks. I mean, this, this was not just, uh, mm -hmm. and there had been three other fairly substantial nationally reported uh, slave revolts prior to this one. Uh, so this this was not uh, just an aberration with some crazy guy named Nat Turner who had visions. The problem that I see with the film is that it's an almost an impossible film to make because so many different people want so many causal narratives, uh, explanations for Nat's motives, and I'm curious, as a question to the group, uh, is um, what did you see as the primary motives for Nat leading this rebellion and scaring the hell out of the country? Uh, in January of 32, the, uh, the event occurs in August, on August 22nd, lasts for two days to the 24th. Nat Turner escapes. He's gone for six to eight weeks. Uh, and uh, the rest of them are all given court trials. Uh, two to three hundred uh, free and enslaved blacks are killed as in, in retribution. A number of the 80 who participated in the revolt were killed. A number of the slave owners in the establishment immediately wanted trials for all of them so that they didn't lose their property that was very valuable. And the state would reimburse the slave owner if it went to court and it was found that they rebelled, but if they were just murdered, they got nothing. So you, and then the, the, the another key point, in January of 32, only two months after Nat Turner is enslaved, is, uh, is hung, for two weeks the Virginia legislature debated the emancipation of slaves in the state of Virginia. It was Thomas Jefferson's grandson's wife who was wanted to leave uh, Virginia immediately, was deathly afraid. He said, don't worry, we're two generations away from another Nat Turner uprising. And the Virginia legislature for two weeks discussed it, never went to vote. What they did do, though, is to ban uh, any blacks, including free blacks, from having guns. They increased the militia, and they made a law preventing uh, blacks from learning how to read. So they doubled down hard. This is long after England had stopped 
uh, 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 their slave uh, practices in England itself, and uh, throughout the empire it was gone by 39, and in the late 20s, early 30s, they'd already begun to eliminate slavery throughout their empire. So this was a, you know, just a, 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 a scary event for... Uh, and this uh, kicked off the whole thing with guns in the South. Ha yeah. Having to have, yeah. uh, you know. So, I think Parker's got an impossible task. It was made worse by his own uh, transgressions as a youthful college student, severe, serious transgressions. And then the question is, how should, as an educator, my question is, and we got educators in the room, I see some retired ones, uh, how do we portray Matt Turner in a way that can be appropriated by all of America? instead of a small segment of America. What does that narrative have to look like? And, I, and a lot of the criticisms have to do with the emphasis given. I think he goes to great lengths to try to provide a wide range of causes for the uprising. Uh, and people are disagreeing about the emphasis he gives. I'm curious what other people think. But we, we have one more panelist that might want to get in on this. Oh. Sorry, excuse me. Thank you. I um, I agree as a film critic that the the film itself has issues. I agree as a woman that uh, they were somewhat silenced. Um, I I think I have such a different feeling about the film because of where I saw it at the time of which I saw it, and and we're talking about. Uh, the issue of race in this country being so tenuous, I don't think just now, I think it has been since the founding of our country, and we don't want to admit it. And I think what Nate Parker did, as much as I know he stole the show, I think a lot of first time, and he's a first time filmmaker, I think a lot of them when they star in it. I mean, what Tom Cruise movie do you watch when it's not all about Tom Cruise? <laughs> and I felt this was a story about Matt Turner. And I, I've read some of the history, you know, that he was a zealot, a Christian zealot, and, and he saw um, visions that made him do what he did. Uh, and I think there are def having seen it twice, I just saw it again a few nights ago, I could see that in the film, the way they depicted it, the eclipse, the you know the, the way he was feeling, and I I didn't I didn't mind uh, Nat Turner being front and center. I really didn't. I mean I I definitely agree that women should have had a louder voice. My frustration, I guess, with the whole discussion around the film is we can talk about historical accuracies or inaccuracies, but we should do that with every historical historical film, then not just this one. Why did this one have, you know, yeah, maybe Sundance is filled with white liberals. So is this room. Uh, you know, I think as a proud white liberal, uh, I, don't, I wouldn't mind standing up and sharing for this film. I mean, I felt when Jerry Ann and I saw it, I felt like that's what I wanted to do at the end of it. Um, and I, I just, I don't know, I guess I feel that, uh, you know, it's unfortunate Nate Turner's past. I read, I actually read the court documents of, of what happened because I wanted to be well prepared. And you know, we can go into everything. And as a as a woman who's been sexually assaulted, it's not funny. It's not. It's definitely something that we need to be taken seriously. My question is, why was it brought out at the time it was? We could have that conversation. The other thing is Nat, Nate, getting the Nates and the Nats confused, mm -hmm. Nate Parker in an interview said, when I had to sit through the courtroom during his rape trial, um, I became a changed man. And you know, from my perspective, it's like, thank God you did. Because what, you know, we can talk about what happened. And I would love to be able to ask him, is that why the pivotal moments of this film take place about around rape. Are you trying to send out a message that this is wrong, that I learned my lesson? I don't know, it would be a nice question if Nate Parker were to show up here, that's something I would ask him. At the same time, I don't want to overlook, and then I'll shut up, I don't want to overlook the message this movie portrays, having, you know, 
gone on a journey with Valerie and Jerry Ann for four and a half years about black history and why don't we know anything about it and why aren't we taught it and why aren't we asking the questions about Nat Turner. Nat Turner was one sentence in my history book. There was a Nat Turner rebellion, the slaves rose up for five years, they didn't win, turn the page. So that's the discussion I want to have. And you know, I come at it from a different point of view, um, taking the filmmaker hat off. And, and again, it's more visceral for me um, as to white America needs to have this conversation. We need to look at ourselves in the mirror and say, why is this not important to us? That it's taught in the classroom, that the questions are asked, that we put pushback, that we show up for Black Lives Matter. <laughs> so I have not seen the film, but um, I'm... I decided to try to ed educate myself a little bit about the film and refresh my uh, what I thought I knew about the Nat Turner and the rebellion. So, um, as many of you know, I, I love book TV on C-SPAN. That's where I hang out on the weekends. Yes. <laughs> Sometimes. So anyway, uh, Professor Greenberg from Suffolk University um, uh, was on last weekend and I <coughs> recorded it and finally got around to watching it. It's very interesting what he has to say, not only about this film, in fact he talks very little about this film, but what he talks about and what he has done with um, Charles Barnett, the black director who, who made uh, uh, Life of, of the Sleep to sleep with anger. Well, anyway, he's a black director who nobody's heard of. But he's made some very <laughs> excellent films. Put him on your to-do list. Um, so Professor Greenberg at Suffolk and Andrew Barnett, the director, apparently have done something for PBS, which I am going to look for. And what they did, they started out to do a film that was going to be the real story of Nat Turner. And then they realized that, first of all, who knows what that story is? A guy named Gray interviewed Nat Turner before he was executed, and then later published that interview. So how much of, and that is the original confessions of Nat Turner from 1830 something. How much of it is Nat Turner and how much of it is the interviewer, we still don't know. And then along comes Styron, to your point, who writes his confessions of Nat Turner, which is mostly out of his head and his imagination, and his focus happens to be on the rape, which didn't occur as far as we know in real life. There's nothing to indicate that Nat Turner had any obsession with um, this particular woman, the only person who was killed, <laughs> and um, no, nothing to indicate that he had any obsession with white women. That is the white man's fantasy yeah. of black men. Yeah. And I think, without having seen this movie, that that might have been the reason he used it. So, I don't know about that resist and resistance. We remember that. We need to remember that. All of us. I just wanted to read what Hal Holbrook said about the movie. He said, I am finding it hard to accept the apparent rebuff at the box office of The Birth of a Nation, particularly after seeing the film last weekend. It is an exceptional piece of artistry and a vital portrait of our American experience in trying to live up to ideals we say we have. We, no one should miss it. No one who respects our country and its long struggle to define itself. I am sorry about the conflict Nate, with Nate Parker's past, but let's try for some honesty here. If you want to make a list of the directors and actors mm -hmm. who have rather public indiscretions and who have in some cases been acquitted of them, start counting. Mm -hmm. What troubles me is this. 
are we being particular here with this extraordinary film? because it is about the racist curse that we are struggling to erase from our country, and its director is black. <clears throat> the curse is there. Go look at it. Do we have the courage to do that? It's a fine work. And I have to say that as a white, privileged white woman, when I saw the film, I had the same visceral response that Nancy had. Very important. <laughs> While we're waiting for somebody else to speak, I probably read 20 film reviews before I watched the film. And I was expecting not to like it. I, I thought it was incredibly powerful. I thought it was very well done. I thought Nate Parker was spectacular. The scene where he is try trying to summon the courage of words uh, to share with uh, his fellow slaves and he's tearing up. I mean, it is absolutely, I, that was the highlight of the film for me. There are a lot, I mean, and everybody should see this film. I think it's very powerful. I think there have been a lot of other films that have depicted slavery as bad, if not worse, uh, if you go and see some of these. It didn't break new ground for me in terms of the depiction of the horror. Um, and, uh, but, you know, we're back to the issue of how do we represent Matt Turner? as a national hero. What does that look like? And the critique of Parker is that he humanizes the guy too much and makes the motive sound like revenge and ownership of, of women uh, and uh, a, not a sufficient focus on the values that came out of his study of the Bible. It was the only book he was allowed to read virtually memorized. It was a fabulous orator by all accounts. And at, at, in his bones, he knew that he was equal to all the other humans he encountered. It was that value and his belief that all others, all the enslaved and uh, the free blacks who were also treated as second-class citizens, they deserved their freedom. It was those values that are uh, in our uh, U.S. Constitution, moving from the Bible to the Constitution, I think we've got to move Nat Turner's narrative into a defense of the U.S. Constitution and the democratic principles and beliefs that it reflects. Uh, and uh, certainly the religion is critical, uh, but uh, there's just too big a divide across so many issues. And, and the scene where the whites and the blacks are fighting, you know, this current climate, it's just not going to get, gain traction. So I, I'm asking folks in the audience, how do you depict Nat Turner in a way that has traction uh, beyond uh, white liberals uh, and, uh, and the black community and, and all other colored folk in this country that have been uh, treated far from uh, equitably? I'm not sure how that film can be made. I just, it, it's tough. Uh, well, Hollywood will not do it. Hollywood will do it. And, you know, we're not going to talk about uh, we're not going to talk about uh, uh, Byron, but uh, Bill uh, uh, Bill uh, uh, Siren. Bill Siren wrote a book in '67, '68, uh, Confessions of uh, of Matt Turner. Won the Pulitzer Prize. He was the toast of the of the country. James Baldwin lived with him for nine months before he wrote the film. Gave him his blessing. And then it was revealed that Siren's, Siren, Siren's Nat Turner engaged in a rebellion because he couldn't have a white, white maiden. And uh, <laughs> the backlash didn't occur for many, many, a, a year, at least a year. So uh, the interpretation of Nat Turner is profoundly difficult, in part because it's like a Rorschach. We have very little information. Uh, and, you know, and Valerie, you spoke to it already. You've got this guy, Gray, who shows up while, while Nat's in jail. It's unclear why he shows up, who sends him there. Speculation is that he was probably sent there by the white establishment to quell fears. This guy's an aberration, he's a nut job, uh, it won't happen again. He's got motives, he doesn't want to get at the truth of this thing. 
in the court record, it turns out he did not represent Nat Turner at all, even though it's commonly portrayed that he was Nat Turner's attorney. He was not. So you've got this lack of information and all sorts of folks wanting to appropriate Nat Turner for their own purposes, whether they're religious. I would like to see him appropriated for democratic principles and beliefs. <laughs> So uh, when I was trying to make my point before, I, I went off on a tangent. Uh, what I was trying to say about Professor uh, Greenberg and Andrew Barnett's PBS production, wherever it is or whenever it is, they gave up trying to do the story of Nat Turner. Instead, they did the story about the stories <laughs> because of what you were just saying. There are just so many interpretations, so they could only do it that way and then leave it up to us to try to figure out. And also as an example of, this is how difficult it is to do history. Uh, hello, my name is Aaron Folks. I live here in Portsmouth. Um, I'd like to look at this approach, this whole issue from a, a different perspective, one which I think a lot of people are utterly overlooking, and that is from the perspective of the oneness of humankind. If we just think, just for a moment, who we are, <coughs> looking around at the different colors, the different nationalities, um, different religions, and if we think about where, do we all, where does our source, our common source, and if we look at science now, molecular biology is, has determined that all humanity on the face of the earth stem from a single group of individuals in the southeastern part of Africa. And from that point, they became what are called modern humans and began to move out from that region to different parts of the world acquiring different customs, colors, religions, languages, and in that process, we've begun to view the world through the eyes of multiplicity rather than oneness. And this whole conversation is based on viewing each other as white or black, man, woman. Uh, those are important distinctions, but they really don't define the individual human being as being a creation from a single source, from a single creator. An individual in Iran in 1863 came out with a message addressed to the entire world of humanity in which he bases his message around the axis of the oneness of humankind. And one of his epigrams um, I'll just quote just the first few uh, lines of it. He says, O oh, children of men, he's addressing himself to the entire human population. O oh, children of men, know ye not why we created you all from the same dust? That no one should exalt himself over another. Ponder in your hearts at all times how ye were created. Since we have created you all from one same substance, it is incumbent upon you to be even as one soul, to walk with the same feet, eat with the same mouth, and dwell in the same land, that from your inmost being, by your deeds and actions, the signs of oneness and the essence of detachment may be made manifest. Such is my counsel to you, O concourse of light. Heed ye this counsel, that ye may obtain the fruit of holiness from the tree of one's glory. And elsewhere, he says, the earth is but one country, and humankind its citizens. And there are a number of other quotations like this, which emphasize this oneness of humanity, which we've lost sight of. there as we dialogue. <laughs> can, I, can I just share a real com complicated uh, piece to this? In the very beginning you spoke about 
science, uh, human evolution, making it quite clear that human Homo sapiens radiated up from Africa. That's certainly clear. We are we are one we are one project, the human genome. We've got it mapped, and we're and uh, and yeah, and and Neanderthal's gone. It is one race. Yeah. When there's a uh, Stanford University professor who has been looking at the teaching of genetics to white kids in high school in this country, and it turns out somehow they become more racist and believe there's a great, there is a more significant separation between blacks and whites after studying population genetics. It is stunning. So it's another layer of frustration for anybody trying to uh, eviscerate this absurd idea that there are separate races. I frankly think we should stop using the word, using the word race. And a lot of minority groups, including a lot of blacks, like to use the word race, and it's problematic. I think we've got to stop using the word race. We're immersed in a sea of deception. The film has, for me, has power. The film has ignited conversation. It also exposes again part of the history of those of us who have been blessed by the sun in America, how we were treated. It gives examples of that. And so as a kind of an opening for discourse, it has power. And I don't waste time worrying about what the director did or what the hand somebody talked about. That that's beyond me. I care less about that. Yeah. It hit me. I was struck by, I enjoyed the film for the sense of again seeing the story of life in America for some of its people. And that's a reality. The discourse is open, needed to continue. And I saw, in fact, uh, 12 years slave, I used that in the classroom as a vehicle. And if I had this, I'd use this one too. Because our history has been hidden. And I say to you, and I said all the time, if you want to keep a secret, put it in a book. <laughs> because most of us don't want to read. And so I think the group here for doing this, exposing it, let's have this, and the young man, bless you. And Joe, I know Joe from way back. So there's power there. Everything we hear today is not the truth. Even the lies we hear are no longer lies. It's alternative truth. But I better stop. <laughs> So I have here, here, and then there was somebody over here. I just, I just wanted to second uh, largely what uh, Jerry Ann said, is that this film, I think, I can't think of another film where we're looking at slavery and slaves in something more than just a... Uh, a uh, victim's point of view. The, the moment there are moments of power in this film, that empowerment for slaves, for black people in this film, and uh, the, uh, one of them, I, I think, one of the greatest scenes, and it was the first thing that played on this clip they showed, where he he was uh, he was going to be used by the slave owners to preach the word and keep the slaves in line, and he found in the the story related to what his plight was, and he, the way he delivered that, and the close-ups of the of the, of the uh, people that were listening to him, close-ups of children, of uh, men, women, and this message of empowerment that they were getting, that maybe was going over the heads of the white slave owners, was uh, was something I've never seen in a film. And uh, there were other moments of empowerment. And that is really, truly what makes this groundbreaking film, I think. Um, let's print it. Right. 
Uh, my name's Rick, and uh, I'm a tile installer. So uh, I didn't even know this film existed. Uh, you know, I was never taught about any rebellions or anything like that that happened. Uh, so, um, I, you know, what I, I'm just trying to say is like, uh, a movie like this comes out, and my experience, you know, I came here with the military years ago, uh, but I grew up in the South. And, um, and, you know, my experience is like, a movie like this comes out, yeah, there's a whole vast network that would crush this movie. I mean, right now, if it came out today, if you release this movie today, I can tell you that, you know, I think, you know, there's money that would be thrown to suppress it. There's stories that would come out to suppress it. Uh, talk about the fact that, you know, it doesn't uh, bring out the female characters in it. And that's important, but then it seems to me that that's a complete other battle that I have a young daughter who's in that, you know, who fights for feminist rights. Uh, all of that's brought out because it's a movie like empowering people of color, you know, and, uh, and supporting their right to rebel. And, and I, I think it gets taught if it gets taught. I instantly connect to it because it's injustice. You know, these people are being unjust to these other people, and yeah, they might have the firepower to keep them in their place, but as soon as you can change that dynamic, take it the other way, and it's back to justice. So, uh, I thought this was actually the the original movie that was made, like back in, you know, no. and, uh, and that's why I came, I was like, oh, I want to see this racist piece of garbage. <laughs> so, uh, but, but that's, you know, so I'm in construction, and, and, you know, I can tell you I'm exposed to all sides of this stuff every day of my life, and, um, you know, it's, it's about doing what's happening here today. It's about talking about it and getting it out there and bringing this stuff to light. So, um, yeah, I'll talk about this movie. I'll talk about the story. I'll find out who Nate was and, and what happened. And the fact that the director is a broken dude, you know, when, especially when he was in college, and, and horrible things. But, you know, it seems to me that's just another one of those stories of like, oh yeah, commit a felony and forget it. Never have a voice again, you know, in the world. Never vote, never, never have a job, nothing, you know. And, and that's its own separate card. You're like, you gotta let that go. So the guy, yeah, something horrible happened. And, uh, but that doesn't mean, you know, don't get the story out. I mean, I think. That doesn't mean don't get the story out there. So, um, you know, it's just those things. That's how it impacts me. And uh, whoever, you know, everybody that's responsible for putting this on, uh, God bless you, man. This is like, <laughs> this, is the, this is the fight. This is what we need. And, uh, you know, we, things are turning. I mean, they are. I live in a world where they're turning. It might be an ugly, it might be an ugly ride for a while. But <laughs> So much. This is why we do what we do. Nice. So thank you so much. Hi. Uh, in spite of um, what has been said about uh, Styron's book, which I read recently, published 50 years ago today, you know, sometimes historic fiction is the closest we can get to the truth or good fiction. Tony Morrison, I don't need to run down the list, but Bill Styron, in spite of what has been said, there are a lot of redeeming <coughs> qualities in that book. The other thing I wanted to mention, somebody was mentioning, is only one line about Nat Turner in that textbook, and that's the truth. Unless your textbook is a people's history of the United States, which is what <laughs> I used for my students. And fortunately, they got to school in Seacoast, not Portsmouth, it was the Oyster River. But it's unfortunate that that, because that would drive the people in Texas crazy if that was the national textbook. <laughs> because there's two pages on Nat Turner in there and all the context in which this slave uprising occurred. So very important to try to get that book out there. So, and it's not like, oh, it's hidden, because it's in a book. 
make it a textbook. To read the thing from cover to cover, just go to that chapter, a whole chapter on slave insurrection, slave resistance, uh, Harriet Tubman, the whole thing. It's very important. Okay? But all those textbooks are published in Texas. But Dr. Nelson <laughs> actually <laughs> uses that textbook in his history class because my son took it. I know I've said this before to you a million times. But I'll never forget my son Galen coming home from school going, what do you mean Columbus did this? And what do you mean about it? He was so fired up. But it's because you actually Xerox copies of people's history of the United States to teach your students. So bravo. My students have turned a lot of parents around. <laughs> I just wanted to say I'm Diane from Kittery, and I am really looking forward to seeing the movie. Um, I, Jerry Ann told me by email that it would just be clips today, but um, when I saw it, I wanted to come because I've been wanting to see the movie. But uh, this is the kind of movie that it's you really have to be in the right frame of mind to see. You can't be tired. You have to be like, okay, I'm up for this um, because it can be difficult. And I, I think that's as you were saying about the box office was, was probably a, a big factor. Americans don't like to go to those movies. And especially I, in times of crisis. Yeah, yeah, crisis. yeah. In fact, I, I heard the other day that of the eight or so films, nine films nominated for Best Picture, most Americans haven't seen any of them because mm -hmm. maybe with the exception of... And, and they're loving La La Land. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But even, even most <laughs> people... about dancing. They haven't, they haven't even seen La La Land. But... Um, I saw a lot of the inter I saw an interview with Parker when the movie came out, and it, it really did bother me that they that this story came out about the rape. I mean, it bothered me that it was coming up because he had gone through an adjudication process, and you know I'm sure if the case was brought to trial, it was a serious case, but he was acquitted, and we you know I mean he was 19 or 20. And that's a whole other story that you know about young men and and date rape culture and all that sort of thing, but. You can't let the guy is he's third in his thirties and um, it, it bothered me that, that there was this attempt to sabotage his career and, and as an artist. Um, and I am an educator and one thing I like to tell my students or remind my students because they don't remember is that there a there are a, a lot of people alive today who had maybe less grandparents but um, great grandparents who were born into slavery and I think it's so easy to forget that. So true. And he had had consensual sex with her before. Uh, I think that's an important fact as well. And I'll, you know, I'm talking about uh, slavery and indentured servitude. I just found out about seven years ago that my father's mother, my grandmother, was an indentured servant for seven years on Staten Island at the turn of the century, the previous century and uh, stunning. She met nobody for seven years, took a train from New York over to Chicago, met my grandfather and, uh, and, and started her life. He basically came from medieval Catholic Poland, um, you know, at the turn of the century. And so, uh, you know, just a lot of, a lot of abusive behaviors among humans. Hi, my name's Jack Rye, and uh, I can't tell you how uh, happy I am that this and these forums exist on the seacoast. I'm originally from New York, and uh, I moved to this uh, to this state where diversity is um, not not really a, a something that you see every day. Unless you go, well, you gotta come here. <laughs> but I appreciate. I've listened to everyone on the panel, and I came here with an open mind, and I appreciate each one of your points of view, and I can't do anything but em embrace them in some way. There's, there's a, a, an honesty and truth in all of it. I will say one thing, though, uh, concerning some of the questions you put out. The first one is um, the movie itself, The Birth of a Nation. So if you think back to the first one, 1915, it's kind of ironic that the criticism of this movie, or some of them, when you juxtapose it with that movie, that movie is blatantly racist, right? Everyone can agree on that. And yet, it's considered, in many lists, one of the top, um, if not best movies, important movies in, in this country. And it's because of its technical, they said, they, it's framed because of all of the technical innovations, and put aside, 
the racist content throughout the entire movie, it's applauded because there are technical innovations. And that's how we, we, we frame, frame these types of things. So in that regard, I, I, I consider it interesting that it takes the same title from a movie that was that harsh, and yet it still is shown in colleges, universities, because of uh, its importance as a, in, in, in cinema. Um, the second thing I want to talk about is rebellions, and I, I'm, I'm very interested in the comments that were made here, and I think um, the idea that finally somebody rose up, and you can see this uh, on film as opposed to reading it, because I agree, it's very hard to, to imagine these things. You, get, you may go to the movies for entertainment, I agree, to learn something, but you also want to be moved, and, and to go to a movie and to see something as profound as what you saw in Django, which was almost audacious, and then to see 12 Years a Slave, which you're constantly rooting for, you know, our, our uh, leading role to, to do something, to, to break out. This film, it happens. Um, it's kind of interesting. The idea that the <coughs> filmmaker has, uh, the criticisms about this filmmaker, which None of us can know exactly what, where that truth lies, and that is sorted out, I guess, in our courts, and it has been. You know, you think about The Passion of Christ, right? When Mel Gibson made that movie, you know, if you've seen that movie, right, that, that, was, that was an amazing and emotional movie. And yet, in that movie, there were overtones of anti-Semitism, apparently, uh, as per the critics. Um, but it still was a powerful film by a person who was flawed. Uh, the producer. Um, rebellion. So the, the rebellion here with Nat Turner, um, you know, I have a child who goes to school in, in South Carolina, and so I've actually become very interested in my journeys down there of finding where slavery is. And because you can't find it up here as easily. Um, you can find it in books, right? Uh, the, the abolitionists, and you know, up here in Boston is the sea. But going down to the south, I found it's hard to find slavery. And I went to Charleston, and I said, I'm going to find some some interesting things here. And it took me a day, and I finally found an old slave mart. That's it. Now I was to Berlin the previous year, and I found everywhere through that city monuments and museums to the Nazis. These people have dedicated themselves to outing one of, the, one of the, the abominations of modern times. And I think, um, I think we don't do a good job in this country of outing slavery. And before Manat Turner, there was the Stoner Rebellion, 100 years before that in South Carolina, which I now know, I made my trips down there, and I make a good point. But I didn't know this, I didn't learn it, uh, no one made an important part of my education, and I think I've, I've had an opportunity to be exposed to a lot of education. But uh, we have the Negro Act from 1740, 100 years before this rebellion, and that was a response by a, a white uh, uh, political um, body to an act. It has a name, and it became law. Even though most of that law was not very uh, uh, advantageous for anyone who was a slave or a, a person of color who was a free man. But, uh, you know, it led to, uh, you know, Nat Turner. Nat Turner, I'm sure there are rebellions that are buried in history that we'll never hear about after him. But um, I applaud the movie, the movie maker, and the forum, and the people who stand up here and give these viewpoints. Um, it's a wonderful afternoon. <laughs> Thank you so much. I see a bunch of hands, but I also just want to um, raise two questions for you to think about um, that this film brought to me is, who is a freedom fighter and who is a terrorist? When do we label them so? <laughs> when they're our friends, they're freedom fighters. <laughs> they're not the terrorists. <laughs> so, yeah. And I, I just want to um, comment about uh, the resistance movement and the fact that not all resistance was violent 
and that enslaved people were resisting from the very beginning, some of them before they even got here, when they jumped overboard instead of allowing themselves to be uh, tortured and terrorized aboard ship, and uh, after they arrived by <coughs> refusing to work or having work slowdowns or breaking the tools or setting the damn town on fire, um, there were lots of ways to resist. I also want to say that the Black Heritage Trail of New Hampshire is, is working to make this history visible in our state so you can visit it. <laughs> and when we get around to having our museum, we'll have one here. I just wanted to say a couple other things. Um, first of all, about the, uh, the women issue. Uh, you know, I was viscerally moved by the way the women are treated and is depicted and have always been. Um, recently, I read a book. It's entitled, I Am the Jude. I am 10 years old and divorced. It's about a girl who grew up in Yemen where in that country they have the uh, girls who haven't even reached puberty to drop to an older man. This is a common custom. Uh, this one of the, this little girl recounts her story of being forced to marry a man that's in his 40s. And he penetrated her. And she uh, had a lot of uh, emotional trauma as a result of that. And felt that she had to speak out. And she was just two years old at the time. She ran away from home. and. Uh, people gave her assistance and uh, sustenance and courage, uh, encouragement, and she wrote this book. Uh, it's very moving. Uh, in Saudi Arabia, they have male guardianship where the women are virtual slaves. They can't leave the home without the permission of the husbands or the brothers or uncles or what have you. Uh, I had the, um, the fortune of going to Zanzibar, which was the final point for slavery on the East Coast. Uh, of Africa, and Oman was one of the principal exporters of slaves from Zanzibar. It was in 2014, I went there for the Zanzibar International Film Festival. Um, I just wanted to go there to meet the people and to experience the culture, and um, I wanted to see the uh, monuments of slavery, to slavery, uh, and about that history. And I met a gentleman at um, a tourist spot where uh, his, his responsibility was to show the slave caverns that were used to uh, hide the slaves from Zanzibar who were brought from East Africa into Zanzibar. And then they were boarded on ships and taken to Oman, the Persian Gulf countries, and over to Pakistan and India. And we had a conversation in one of the caverns. It was about a dozen feet, uh, a dozen steps um, below ground. And we were just looking at, talking about the conditions uh, that the slaves had to endure before being shipped off onto these uh, se uh, secret ships. The British had outlawed slavery by that time, but the Arabs were still very much involved in exporting slaves from through Zanzibar to Oman. Okay, we're getting pretty close to our time, so I'll just take one more question and then have the panel talk. Yeah, I'm so glad you mentioned the first birth of the nation. Uh, I didn't learn this in a book now, I learned this from documentary film, a much more effective, in my opinion, uh, way of getting the truth out. Historic fiction films are excellent, but documentary film, I don't know if you're aware of it, but this month there's probably been two dozen black-related films shown on public television, just extraordinary. And one of them told the story about William Trotter, who really started the modern civil rights movement in his effort to suppress the first birth of a nation title of the film is called Birth of a Movement. And even though we didn't succeed because of First Amendment rights, and so the very first blockbuster was wildly successful in Boston, he fought an incredible battle, and that laid the basis for the modern civil rights movement. So a real shout out to documentary film. The second thing you mentioned, he was so right. When I took a tour of the Whitney Museum of Slavery, a private museum in Louisiana, was one of the first things he said. He talked about Germany and how the Germans have come to grips with this and there are monuments all over the place to the Holocaust. And yet you go all over this country, the plantations, and what do you get? You get white slave owner history, except at the Whitney Plantation. 
<laughs> and so uh, yesterday on C-SPAN, this very subject you were talking about, race, there was an amazing discussion. I mean, I, don't, I hope you people do what Valerie and I do on the weekends. It's absolutely extraordinary. It surpasses PBS what is on C-SPAN. This is cinema verite. You're getting unfiltered America the way you can't get it any other place. And there was a black man speaking about Confederate war monuments. And he was in an argument with another black man about whether we should use the term race or not. Absolutely powerful. It went to the heart of what you were trying to bring up, Joe. Very, very important. So thank you. Thank you so much. I you were say well, I, I was actually. I was going to plug another PBS special. I think it's a six-part series on the history of uh, Homo sapiens. I think it's about six parts. There's a fantastic moment when uh, the very dark-complected Homo sapiens coming up out of North Africa are going into Europe, and they're encountering the white Neanderthal, and there is a battle, <laughs> and. Homo sapiens, our ancestors, take out the white Neanderthals. I wish we could plug some electrodes on a whole bunch of folks in America and see their reaction. Oh, I'm rooting for the wrong group. And, um, you know, the, and the, the key point here is that when white America watches Nat Turner and films like this, why isn't the reaction? a celebration of freedom, emancipation, uh, pursuit of happiness, everything that's in our Declaration of Independence and the um, uh, U.S. Constitution, but instead this very visceral value of race trumping these democratic values. And we've got to get back to civic education in this country. Uh, and I'm, you know, we've got racist whites, we've got Breitbart, we got folks who are not very religious, and frankly, I'm equally fearful of highly the evangelical, literalist, Bible, Bible thumping literalist who is a creationist, who also puts the Bible ahead of our U.S. Constitution. Uh, we've got to get back to a commitment to that founding document. That is our central document. Religious texts are all guaranteed in the First Amendment. We are going to allow freedom of religious expression. Our founding fathers were either deists or they were Christians, and yet they wrote the First Amendment. They did not privilege Christianity. We now have a commissioner of education, brand new commissioner of education, Frank Edelblood, who is a creationist. The earth was created in six days, 6,000 years ago, and he's running our public school system. Chris Sununu appointed him. He believes that women are literally coming from Adam's rib, that women are here to uh, be subservient to men. I highly recommend you look at Patrick Henry College. He's been, a found, he's been a board member at Patrick Henry College for eight years. Yeah, so in my uh, closing remarks, uh, after sitting here and um, listening to uh, everybody had to say it, uh, I wrote down uh, a couple things um, and just kind of three key things that um, kind of stood out to me after the conversation is uh, uh, narrative, knowledge, ignorance. Um, so I think uh, narrative, how you talk, how you see it is going to determine a lot of times the knowledge in which um, you are trying to get and obtain how you're going to see it. and. Um, you know, and you know, they say like ignorance is like the, the lack of knowledge, right? So, um, you know, uh, Charles Mills has said that, you know, ignorance can be, uh, you know, false belief or the absence of true belief. So you could have, your ignorance uh, could be in a sense of, you know what you're saying is wrong, um, but I have a false belief in it and I'm gonna tell you even though I know it's wrong. And I could have, you know, the absence of true belief where I'm telling you it, that's my knowledge, but I don't know it's wrong, but I'm telling it to you. Um, and then you know you can have you know those kind of dualities going on. So I think um, what ends up happening is when you talked about uh, you, you mentioned you know um, the gentleman had mentioned uh, DNA genetics and how you know we talked about you know Homo erectus from Homo sapiens to the dissemination of the people to uh, different continents. So uh, in reality, um, you know we know the truth, right? It's in the book. You're like, okay, well this science they kind of said this is what it is, but you have people who would 
believe and say, say otherwise, right? And then you can say, well, you know the truth, so now you have false belief. But you, you're going and you know, so you're not false belief, you have the ignorance in you when you're talking about it. Or you have people who generally um, don't believe in uh, uh, evolution at all, um, in the creationism, and then you could have an absence of true belief. And then what's happened is you have people, same topic, but two different narratives, two different um, ways you're approaching it, and then what ends up happening is you can get a, a, a split of people, and I say people with different groups and things of that nature. And um, also to touch on the point uh, that you mentioned about um, when Nate was, uh, or Matt was in the movie and he was preaching uh, to uh, the, uh, the fellow, his fellow slaves, you know, when he was saying certain lines, and he was, you know, the, the slave owner said, I don't really care what you're saying as long as you say what, I, what you're supposed to say, right? Mm -hmm. So in reality, you, you, you look at it like, wait, I don't think they know what's in the Bible themselves, right? <laughs> I don't think they know. Because if you notice, when he says, once he reaches a certain point and he starts talking about, um, you know, it, his, his message goes a little about liberation, but it starts small. At first he's saying, you know, we would um, oppose those who oppose us. And then he's saying, you know, um, you know, guide me on my, my sword. And he starts really small and he gets bigger and bigger in what he's saying, right? But every time he says something a little small, you know, the, 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 the white folks in the room, it's like, yeah, that's what I want to do, <laughs> right? But then, and then the people of color is like, wait, that's, they're like, wait, wait, that's not, uh, he's not saying what you think he should be saying. He's saying something else. So, so then, and he, and he goes on, he says, you know, as what they say, there's something else to, to, come, to come back and refute that. So in reality, what ends up happening is you could have the same you could have the same text, right? And they you you could use the Bible as to oppress somebody. You could have like the Crusades where like we're gonna use this and we're gonna tell you what to do based on the Bible. We're gonna have you go kill a bunch of people and we're gonna oppress you with this text. Or you could use it to free the people in which he did, or or you could use it to find the middle ground in which you could have it to unite everybody. So I think you know, like I said, those three things: narrative, knowledge, ignorance. And I think um, it all depends on how you view it because, like I said, there's one piece of text. And what's so interesting is in the beginning of the movie, she said, you know, these books over here for white folks, it's knowledge in here that you wouldn't understand. But here's one book you can read, the Bible, the Bible. Just the one book you can read. This, this book right here is knowledge for everybody and not just um, white or black. So what's interesting is now we recognize that as a universal text. And even if you don't believe um, in, in uh, God or whatever the case may be, you can recognize that there's, there's lessons to be learned in the book without even having um, a connection to a higher being. If you can just read it, like, you understand there's, there's little lessons and nuances in there to begin with. So I think um, my closing part was interesting about it is, you know, it just depends on your perspective, your narrative, and how you're trying to go about it and how you're trying to see it. Because if you're trying to use something for a specific agenda and purpose, you're going to find that agenda and purpose in anything. If you use it for another way, you're going to find that way. And then for somewhere in between those two, we're going to hit the truth as to what it should be and what people should perceive it as. That's my last time. Wow. <laughs> Taylor, we just have one question from the floor before we go. Oh, okay. I just like to make it. Oh, I'm going to make it. I'm going to make it. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, I just wanted to add, um, Valerie was talking about how C-SPAN has all this fascinating um, uh, uh, material going on that's revising our look at history. There is a lot out there now, thanks to people who are in, um, uh, especially in, in academia, they're doing all kinds of things. Um, whether it's African American history, um, African history, Native American history, um, Asian American history, European history, and changing that whole thing of history. There's um, what I just released this past month is a really exciting book by a professor um, at Delaware. Um, I think her name is, I know her last name is Dunbar. Maybe her first Erica, name is Elizabeth. She's going to be here next week. Oh, really? Yes. Oh, really? About George next Washington Sunday. Slade. Well, who? Yeah. Yeah. Right here? Yeah. 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 Cherry and Elizabeth. Yeah, yeah. 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 never caught. I mean, yeah. I'm made, they, I'm, and this is a, all about George Washington Slave. Yeah. Um, and there's oh, a yeah. lot of work like this that is coming out now. and looking at history closer and not the typical, you know, more along the lines of Zen um, and other elements and looking at that, um, things that we didn't get taught about in school. It's a lot out there on Native American, um, 
all and all various sorts of things thanks to all the various voices that are now in academia which is one reason why Trump's um, administration is going after um, academia you know because of all these various voices out there um, and while he's using alternative fact and alternative truth and all this sort of thing because they're bringing out different elements um, that's there I just want to ask Ray, I know you said you're going into IT, but I think politics also would be a great field for you to consider. <laughs> we need people, we need young people like you. Speaking of young people, and kind of bouncing off what you said, um, when did you start thinking about running for office? Um, as I said earlier, going on my journey, I thought I would never run for office. And then I thought, well, I could probably do it in the next five years. Well, I thought, well, I could probably do it in the next five years. Well, I thought, well, I could probably do it in the next five years. Well, I thought, well, I could probably do it in the next five years. Well, I thought, well, I could probably do it in the next five years. Well, I thought, well, I could probably do it in the next five years. Well, I thought, well, I could probably do it in the next five years. Well, I admire all the teachers and the professors in this room and beyond to, to keep doing what you're doing. And it's fantastic, and you can talk about Erica Dunbar coming next Sunday. Um, but I think we need to get it into the classroom. And I, as a revived organizer um, <laughs> lately, I think it's imperative, and I feel like I can say this freely in this room, that we get out and do something that we not only resist but we persist and I read something at a, a gathering I had I was expecting 10 or 15 people I had 40 and I said remember I, it's not my words but remember the music when you were taught in music that you were singing in a choir and there was a long note you needed to hold breathe and let somebody else carry that note for you and I think we're kind of in the fight for our democracy right now and it all started at the beginning 200 odd years ago with a couple of rich white men landholders who wrote our Constitution Bravo for them for the First Amendment but I think we do need to keep fighting for what we have here and the ability to talk about this here we need to be able to teach it in school. Everything needs to come to light. We need to get civics back into the classroom. Yes, Valerie. <laughs> um, I'm not asking you as a university professor, just as a citizen, to tell us what you know about the New Hampshire standards for history and social, social studies. Oh, well, that's a sad story, too. Uh, uh, you know, I, I, there's a program, it, what we've moved to in the state of New Hampshire is a program called PACE. It's basically an assessment driven model um, that has generic, rather generic uh, skills and abilities that students will demonstrate. They can analyze, they can summarize, they can pull out main points. We've moved away from content to this belief that there are these generic skills that can then magically be applied in any direction. We need more history, not less. Uh, New Hampshire's done a nice job of dealing with the uh, uh, Every Student Succeeds Act, which replaced <coughs> No Child Left Behind and Race to the Top. Race to the Top was as bad as NCLB. We're still assessment driven. We're still not teaching to the whole child. And most importantly, we're just assessing in language arts and mathematics. Science and social studies are second class citizens in the curriculum. And you want, I mean, we need politically astute young people with history, uh, political philosophy under their belt, and who understand science. All people get bamboozled by statistics. We're still teaching geometry. We should be requiring statistics instead of geometry in math classes. So um, it's not a pretty scene in public ed. We got Betsy DeVos as our national ed secretary. Not quite as bad as Frank Edelblood, but also a severe privatizer. And I want all of you as New Hampshire citizens to be aware that the reason Frank Edelblood got the gig was because the Republican establishment wants to increase privatization. They want to see public tax dollars Corporations can funnel as much as 40% of the tax money they owe to the state in the form of scholarships called uh, tax, uh, scholarship tax credits. It will be going to the 1% of homeschoolers who are fundamentalists, who are purchasing materials that say slave owners were good guys. It really wasn't too bad. In fact, the slaves had it worse after the Civil War. Slaves um, were in were immigrants. 
Right. And, 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 yes. And worse, there are picture books that have humans walking with dinosaurs due to creationism. And so your tax dollar is going to go to that 1%. The other, the other folks who are going to get the money are the wealthy folks, typically Republicans, and independents, because, but wealth, only wealthy independents. I've never met a poor independent. They're all quite proud of themselves after they make it. But um, the independents and the Republicans are trying to get Frank Edelblood to increase tax credits that will offset their 40 grand a year that they send their middle school and high school kids to the finest prep schools in the country on the backs of taxpayers that undermine our public ed system. That's what we're up against. I did want to just close with this, and I just want you to think about it. America has always been afraid of a slave uprising. Even now, and this is why I think this, this, there was this concerted effort not to have this, sex, this film succeed, is that we're still afraid of blacks uprising, mm -hmm. that they're going to do exactly what we saw on the film, you know, and then, you know, it wouldn't be pretty, but because we know this history wasn't, so we've always, America's always been afraid of retribution mm -hmm. for the deeds that were done during slavery. And I close on that note. Thank you so much for coming.